This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 50. Coming up on Space Time, climate change shifts the axis of the Earth, what may be the nearest black hole to the Earth, and one of the world's most powerful rockets successfully launches a new spy satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims glacial melting due to global warming was the likely cause of a shift in the movement of Earth's poles during the 1990s. The location of the planet's north and south poles aren't static, unchanging spots. The axis that the Earth spins around, or more specifically, the surface that the invisible line emerges from, is always moving through polar wander, a process not well understood. The way water is distributed on Earth's surface is one factor that drives this drift. Now a report in the journal Geophysical Research Letters claims melting glaciers redistributed enough water to cause the direction of polar wander to turn and accelerate eastwards during the mid-1990s. Think of the Earth rotating around its spin axis like a spinning toy top. Now if the weight distribution of the top is altered and moved around, the spinning top would start to lean and wobble as its rotational axis changes. And the same thing happens on a much larger scale to the Earth as weight gets shifted from one area to another due to melting ice. The study's authors were able to determine the causes of polar drifts using data from the joint NASA and German Space Agency Twin GRACE Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment spacecraft. The first pair of GRACE satellites were launched in 2002 and a follow-up mission with two more satellites flew in 2018. The mission's been gathering information on how mass is distributed around the planet by measuring uneven changes in gravity at different points. More mass means more gravity. Previous GRACE mission data revealed that more recent movements in the North Pole away from Canada and towards Russia was most likely caused by changes in the circulation pattern of Earth's molten outer core. But GRACE found other shifts which were affected by terrestrial water storage change the process by which all the water on land, including frozen water in glaciers and groundwater stored under the continents, is being lost through a combination of melting and groundwater pumping. The authors also wanted to determine if that could explain changes that occurred during the mid-1990s. See, in 1995, the direction of the polar drift shifted from southward to eastwards. The average speed of drift from 1995 to 2020 also increased about 17 times from the average speed recorded between 1981 and 1995. Now, the researchers have found a way to wind modern polar tracking analysis backwards in time to learn why this drift occurred. The new research calculates the total land water loss in the 1990s before the GRACE mission began. The study's lead author Zia Lu and colleagues from the Chinese Academy of Sciences found that the loss of water mass frozen in the polar regions of the planet was the primary driver of eastward's polar drift during the 1990s. But the authors also found that the faster ice melting couldn't entirely explain the shift. A slight remaining gap in the numbers is attributed to unsustainable groundwater pumping for agriculture in non-polar areas. The research showed large changes in water mass in areas like California, northern Texas and the region around Beijing as well as across northern India, all areas that have been pumping large amounts of groundwater for agricultural use. The change in Earth's spin axis isn't large enough to affect daily life, although it could change the length of a day by a few milliseconds. This is Space Time. Still to come, discovery of what may be the nearest black hole to Earth and NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 successfully docks with the International Space Station. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered what may be the nearest black hole to Earth. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, suggest that a newly discovered stellar mass black hole candidate appears to be in a binary system with a well-known nearby red giant called V723 Monocerotus, which is located just 1,500 light-years away in the constellation of Monoceros. 
V723 Monas Cerotis has the same mass as the Sun, but as a red giant it's now bloated out to some 25 times the Sun's diameter. Ohio State University's Tarindrajaya Singh and Todd Thompson and colleagues were looking through archival data on V723 when they noticed something they couldn't see, which appeared to be orbiting the red giant and was causing light from the star to change in intensity and appearance at regular intervals. It seems something with around three times the mass of our sun was gravitationally perturbing the red giant, causing a total distortion that was changing its shape. And the most likely explanation for this would be a small stellar mass black hole, a black hole candidate, which the authors are now calling the unicorn. But at just three solar masses, this would be one of the smallest black holes ever detected. This report from The Ohio State University. In 2020, researchers at The Ohio State University looked to the skies in search of a unicorn. But unlike our favorite mythical creature, this unicorn is an example of a once undetectable black hole, possibly the closest to our solar system. Black holes have been kind of a big deal ever since the first photo of a supermassive black hole was taken in 2019. Black holes are exceptionally hard to find because they don't emit any light. To pinpoint where they are, you look at how nearby stars interact with them and measure the X-ray activity. The way that's yielded the most black holes was to go look for X-ray emission. The black hole is stripping material off of the star, and as the black hole strips material off of the star, it emits a bunch of X-rays. And those X-rays are very prominent. Scientists believe there are many more black holes in the universe we haven't identified yet. Black holes that aren't interacting with a star and have very little X-ray activity. From theoretical models, we know that there are thousands of these non-interacting black holes in the galaxy, and scientists uh, from all over the world are very interested in finding these non-interacting black holes. Ohio State University professor Todd Thompson and presidential fellow Tarendu Jayasinghe looked at the problem and set out to prove that black holes can be discovered in a different way. They set their sights on an unusual object in the constellation Monoceros, the unicorn constellation. There, an unknown mass is causing a disruption in the shape of the light coming from a surrounding older star called a red giant. Black hole's gravity distorts the shape of the red giant and the distortion creates changes in how we see the star over the uh, face of the orbit of the black hole around the giant. And you can measure how fast it's coming towards you and how fast it's going away. And you can also measure how the star is distorted by the gravity of the nearby dark object. And this particular star is in this, is in this teardrop shape. By measuring the Doppler shift and ellipsoidal variability, the researchers have identified this as a black hole. What's unique is this black hole is only 1,500 light years away, making it the closest one to Earth. It's also among the smallest black holes to be discovered at only three times the size of our sun because the system is so unique and so weird that, you know, it definitely warranted the nickname of the unicorn. The researchers hope this method of measuring the shape and orbit of nearby stars will be used to identify more non-interacting black holes and provide data about their formation in our universe. When you look in new ways and you find a new thing, then you say, well, you know, we need to keep looking in this way because we might find a lot of these new things. And in that report from Ohio State University, we heard from Todd Thompson and Tarandu Jayasinghe. Meanwhile, a May 2020 study hypothesized that the double or triple star system in the Southern Constellation of Telescopium, known as HR 6819 HD 167128, or QV Telescopy, which is located about 1,120 light years away, could in fact be the nearest black hole to Earth. If confirmed, it would also be the first system with a black hole visible to the unaided eye. A second study published two months later concluded that rather than a triple star system, it was more likely to be a binary black hole and star orbiting at one distance and another star at a different distance. However, three further 2020 papers have since argued that HR 6819 is in fact simply a binary system with two mainstream stars and no black hole at all. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new Dragon crew arrives safely aboard the International Space Station. 
And one of the world's most powerful rockets has launched a new American spy satellite. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 has successfully docked with the International Space Station with a second commercial crew rotation mission. The mission blasted into orbit aboard a Crew Dragon 2 spacecraft named Endeavour, mounted on a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Mission and liftoff. Got speed Endeavour and crew two. Copy one alpha. Endeavour launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on crew two now making their way to the one and only International Space Station. The vehicle is pitching down range. Nine Merlin engines on the first stage providing 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Hearing good calls on first stage performance so far. Plus 30 seconds into the second rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Falcon 9 will be throttling down the nine Merlin engines shortly here in preparation for maximum dynamic pressure. And there's that call out for the throttle down. Maximum dynamic pressure, max Q, is the largest structural load that the vehicle sees throughout ascent. So throttling down does help us pass. Supersonic. Throwing down helps us pass through this period, which should be coming here shortly. Max Q. There's our call out that we have just passed through Max Q. Stage one throttle up. And one we can Bravo. Now... Copy one Bravo. All right, one Bravo is the second abort mode on the first stage. The first stage continues to fire for two minutes, 35 seconds. One and a half minutes into today's flight. Falcon 9 now traveling at 1,500 miles an hour. And the engine chill has started. All right, the engine chill for the second stage single Merlin engine has started. About 30 more seconds of the first stage firing to bring our four astronauts into orbit. Now from here coming up in about 20 some seconds, we're going to have three major milestones. We'll have shutdown of the nine Merlin engines. We're beginning to throttle them down. We will then get stage, stage separation. One, throttle down. And then we will get ignition of the second stage engine to propel Dragon and the Falcon 9 second stage into orbit. Two and Alpha. Go. Copy, two Alpha. Confirmed. Acquisition signal launch. And, uh, and we have ignition of the second stage. The expansion nozzle on the second stage Merlin vacuum glowing that bright red. Good performance on the second stage so far. The uh, exhaust of the second stage engine streaming past the first stage is the grid fins are coming out. Currently, the first stage is continuing to coast up to apogee. It's unpowered. It'll reach a peak height and then begin to descend back down toward the Earth's atmosphere, where it will light three engines to slow down in preparation for what will be a landing burn on the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. The grid fins are deployed right now. The first stage Dragon pulsing. SpaceX trajectory nominal. We're pulsing the thrusters. Signal Bermuda. Copy, nominal trajectory. We hear a call out from the crew, nominal trajectory. So we're beginning to move the first stage into position so it can do the entry burn. Four minutes, 15 seconds into today's flight. Second stage propelling our four astronauts up the eastern seaboard. We'll continue to fire. It's a six-minute burn to deliver the astronauts into orbit. We'll wait for a cue for good orbital insertion after that. Meanwhile, we will be hearing uh, check-ins on the vehicle's trajectory and performance, as well as check-ins with some of the ground stations as it passes over uh, throughout the Six minutes of the second stage firing. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Copy nominal trajectory. Acquisition of signal bus. The New Hampshire tracking station has acquired the second stage telemetry signal. Meanwhile, the first stage has reached apogee and it's now beginning to descend from uh, a height. It's currently about 167 kilometers up. And in a few minutes, we will get the entry burn of the first stage. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Copy nominal trajectory. Right on cue, those check-ins on the second stage performance. Once a minute, everything's looking good on stage that second stage. Propulsion is nominal. Stage two continues to climb. The vehicle now exceeding 8,000 miles an hour at an altitude of about 124 miles. 
And just about one minute from now, we will begin the entry burn of the first stage. That will consist of lighting the center engine, and then shortly afterwards, two more engines for a three-engine burn to slow down the first stage in preparation for entering the Earth's atmosphere. Another check-in, and the crew confirming they're hearing the same thing. The vehicle exceeding, are about to exceed about 10,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, first stage down at 90 kilometers, getting ready to relight three engines for the entry burn. Stage two FTS has saved. We've got the center engine ignition, and there come the two side engines. Now this entry burn will last about 29 seconds. It's going to significantly slow down the vehicle in preparation for hitting the denser part of the Earth's atmosphere. Entry burn complete. We're down below 35 kilometers, continuing to look good on the first stage, heading to the Atlantic Ocean for a landing on the drone ship. While second stage is less than a minute away from cutoff. Stage two in terminal guidance. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. Shannon called out at the back end of stage two. A few seconds until cutoff. Impact shutdown. Dragon SpaceX launch escape system disarmed. Launch escape system disarmed. Copy. Dragon SpaceX nominal orbit insertion. Copy. Nominal orbital insertion. All right. The Falcon 9 second stage has done its job delivering our four crew into orbit. You hear the applause here in Hawthorne. In the drone ship, of course, I still love you. It looks like first stage on the drone ship. So the first stage is on the drone ship, successfully landed. And more importantly, second stage is in a nominal orbit with the Dragon spacecraft getting ready for some important events coming up, Gary. That's right. About two more minutes, the Dragon and the second stage of the Falcon 9 will be in a coast phase. It'll take that long until the spacecraft separates from the Falcon 9. Of course, both uh, now in a nominal orbit, Dragon traveling at nearly 17,000 miles per hour and an altitude of 124 miles. Again, the four-person crew of Endeavor is in orbit right now. Ten seconds to spacecraft separation. The Crew Dragon spacecraft docked autonomously with a forward port on the orbiting outpost Harmony module. It's four crew members joining the seven Expedition 65 crew members now on station and bringing the ISS's total complement to 11. The mission has marked a number of firsts including the first commercial American crew to fly two international partners, in this case France and Japan. It's also the first commercial crew handover between astronauts on the space station, as Crew 1 and Crew 2 astronauts will spend about five days together on station before Crew 1 returned to Earth. It was the first reuse of a Crew Dragon 2 spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket on a manned mission, Crew Dragon Endeavour having flown the historic Demo 2 manned mission to the space station back in 2019. And the same Falcon 9 launch vehicle flew the astronauts on last year's Crew-1 mission in November. And finally, it was the first time two commercial crew spacecraft were docked at the space station at the same time. The Crew-2 members will remain on station for at least six months, returning no earlier than October 31st. During their time on the orbiting outpost as part of the Expedition 65 crew, they'll continue work on more than 250 ongoing experiments and they'll undertake research in preparing for the Lunar Gateway space station and the Artemis missions to the Moon. An important scientific focus for Expedition 65 is continuing a series of studies of tissue chips in space. Tissue chips are small models of human organs containing multiple cell types that behave much the same way as what they would in the human body. The crew will also continue work on augmenting the space station's solar power system by undertaking a series of spacewalks to install the first pair of six new ISS rollout solar arrays. The Crew Dragon spacecraft also delivered 100 kilograms of new cargo and fresh scientific supplies and hardware. Among the experiments delivered is a study looking at possible causes for suppressed immune system response in microgravity. During their stay aboard the orbiting outpost, the Expedition 65 crew will also receive supplies from several visiting spacecraft, including a Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo ship, a SpaceX cargo Dragon, and possibly, if it's working by then, Boeing's new CST-100 Starliner on an unmanned mission. This is Space Time. Still to come, one of the world's most powerful rockets successfully launches a new American spy satellite into orbit, and later in the science report, more evidence that tyrannosaurs roamed in packs. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
the world's most powerful rockets, the Delta IV Heavy, has successfully launched a new American spy satellite into orbit. It was one of the final flights for the United Launch Alliance's massive Delta IV Heavy rocket, which combines three rocket core stages mounted side by side. The mission from Space Launch Complex 6 at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California carried the classified National Reconnaissance Office NRL-82 satellite into orbit. Rock, report range status. Rock, range is green. Second stage LH-2, secure at flight level. Status, T-minus go Delta. Seconds. Go NRL-82. Rofi Ignition. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 2, 1... Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy Rocket carrying the NRL-82 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Go on the pitch-over maneuver. The parameters look good on all three cores. Core booster is now throttling down to the partial thrust level. Partial thrust achieved. You are hearing the voice of Rob Kesselman providing launch vehicle ascent data. Now, 50 seconds into flight, vehicle is 3 miles in altitude, 5 miles downrange distance, traveling at 970 miles per hour. All vehicle systems look good at this time. Now, at T plus 80 seconds, vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Mach 1, vehicle is now supersonic. All three RS-68 looks healthy at this time. Vehicle systems continue to be healthy. The second stage, reaction control system pressurization valve has now opened. Now, 125 seconds into flight, Delta is now 18 miles in altitude, 9 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,800 miles per hour. Delta has now gone to closed-loop guidance. Vehicle body rates are nominal. Three minutes remain in the booster phase of flight. Delta 4 rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at Liftoff, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. One minute until port and starboard booster engine cutoff. Vehicle systems look healthy at this time. The attitude control system, autopilot, has controlled all vehicle body rates to near zero. Approximately 30 seconds remaining now until the port and starboard booster engines cut off. Strap-on boosters are now throttling down to the partial thrust level. Strap-on booster cutoff and separation of the strap-on boosters. Core booster is now throttling back up. Core booster is operating as expected at the 100% throttle level. The upper stage lock system has now begun the boost phase kill-down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the RL-10 engine. One minute remaining in the booster phase of flight. Upper stage fuel system has begun the boost phase kill-down sequence. Booster performance continues to look good at this time. Vehicle body rates continue Continue to be near zero as expected. Core booster is now throttling down. And we have Beco, first stage main engine cutoff. We have stage separation. Ned's deployment has begun. Pre-start on the RL-10. We have ignition on the RL-10. That's one. We have indication of successful payload fairing jettison. While details of this top secret clandestine payload remain classified, launches from Vandenberg usually place satellites into highly inclined or elliptical orbits, or even more inclined Molnir orbits, which provide higher latitude dwell times. National Reconnaissance Office communications and signals intelligence gathering satellites would typically only require an Atlas V rocket, which can lift just over 20 tons into low Earth orbit, rather than the more powerful Delta IV Heavy, which can lift almost 29 tons into low Earth orbit. Another clue comes from hazard area warnings where spent rocket stages are likely to fall down, and NOTAMs, which are noticed to airmen, warning pilots and airlines. They show a southwesterly trajectory for this launch, which rules out a Molnir orbit as that will require a flight towards the southeast. It does, however, match a sun-synchronous orbit. They're often used by imaging and remote sensing satellites. And for a spy satellite, it would allow it to pass over the same point on Earth's surface at the same time every day. That way, the light and shadows on the ground would be the same and any changes would be easier to spot. So, what does all this tell us? It tells us that NRL-82 was most likely a big imaging satellite, something requiring a Delta IV Heavy, and that suggests a new keyhole crystal spacecraft. They're the same design which NASA adopted for the Hubble Space Telescope, except instead of pointing outwards to space, they point down towards the Earth. The timing of the launch is also interesting. It suggests that this particular spacecraft is replacing an earlier version, probably at the end of its useful life. Following this mission, the United Launch Alliance has only three Delta IV Heavy rockets left in the fleet, and they're all assigned to further National Reconnaissance Office missions. There'll be one more from Vandenberg and two from Cape Canaveral in Florida. The United Launch Alliance are replacing their Delta IV Heavy and Atlas V launch vehicles with their new next-generation Vulcan Centaur launch system, which is slated to undertake its maiden flight later this year. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. 
A new study warns that increasingly energetic ocean eddies may be affecting climate change. Scientists have long known that oceans are rapidly warming and that sea level is rising. But now researchers have discovered evidence that ocean eddies are becoming more energetic over large regions of the ocean as well. Ocean eddies are whirlpools with sizes between 10 and 100 kilometres across, somewhat like small cyclones in the atmosphere. They're responsible for the weather in the oceans, moving warm and cold water from one location to another. In this way, eddies move and mix heat, carbon, salt and nutrients and affect everything from regional processes right up to global ocean circulation. The discovery reported in the journal Nature Climate Change was made by scientists from the Australian National University and the University of New South Wales and shows clear changes in the distribution and strength of these eddies which had not previously been detected. The idea of being stalked by Tyrannosaur is frightening enough, but a new study has supported previous research suggesting that these giant theropod dinosaurs may well have hunted in packs. It's an idea that's been widely debated, with many paleontologists doubting that the giant predators had the brain power to organise into anything more complex than what's observed in modern-day crocodile feeding frenzies. The pack-hunting Tyrannosaur hypothesis was based on the discovery of the skeletons of more than a dozen Tyrannosaurus individuals at a site in Alberta. But because the Alberta incident appeared to be an isolated case, paleontological sceptics claimed it simply represented a unique set of circumstances, rather than normal tyrannosaur behaviour. However, a second tyrannosaur mass death site has since been discovered in Montana, and now a third, containing at least four individuals, has been uncovered at the Rainbows and Unicorns Quarry site in southern Utah. A report in the journal Pier J claims the new Utah site adds to the growing body of evidence showing that tyrannosaurs were complex, large predators, capable of social behaviours common to many of their living relatives, the birds. Beijing's Orwellian social credit surveillance system, which records the behaviour of people across China, is now expanding globally, with a Hey a hot pot restaurant in Vancouver now monitoring every customer at every table with a network of over 60 surveillance cameras. The data of what's being said and done by each customer at every table is then sent back to China for evaluation. The company has over 935 restaurants around the world. China's social credit system is a national blacklist being developed by the communist government to track and monitor people and evaluate them for their trustworthiness to the communist party. It includes a numerical credit score system to reward and punish people and a Skynet mass surveillance facial recognition system to track people's movements. These social scores are then used to reward or punish citizens. Praise the Chinese government on social media and Big Brother gives you a high score, potentially leading to benefits such as shorter hospital waiting times, access to better schools for your kids and the opportunity to buy a nice car. Protest against the Communist Party or knowingly associate with another individual has a low score and that will cause you to lose points and that means Big Brother will restrict your access to public services, limit your options to public transport and even restrict where you can live. New research suggests there's the potential to substantially reduce computer energy consumption below limits which were previously thought to be unbeatable. The theoretical study reported in the journal Nano Letters shows that electronics based on topological insulators, a new type of material that acts as an insulator on the inside but conducts electricity on the outside, are up to four times more energy efficient than electronics based on conventional semiconductors. By using topological insulators, the study suggests that scientists may finally be able to defeat the age-old enemy of electronics known as Boltzmann's tyranny, which puts a limit on the lowest possible operating voltage for a device. This study, therefore, is a step towards reducing the unsustainable energy load of information and computing technology, which is currently consuming around 10% of all global electricity supplies. Apple has finally launched its long-awaited iOS 14.5 update, which contains no less than 50 key security upgrades. With the details on this and more in the world of technology, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut from ity.com. Apple has launched new operating systems for all of its devices, iPhones, iPads, the HomePod, Apple TV, and the Watch. And with 50 security vulnerabilities patched in iOS 14.5, 
and an actively targeted vulnerability in Mac OS, it's always important to update so you can close these vulnerabilities down. Otherwise, if people send you something in a web page or in an app that's affected, although apps normally aren't so easily uh, circumvented with security, then um, you know you won't be affected. And it's important these days with our phones containing so much information about us that we protect ourselves as much as possible. So the 14.5 update for the iPhone is about a gigabyte in download. For Mac OS, it's about uh, five gigabytes. But of course, these days with fast broadband connections, it's not so big a deal to download such updates. There are new features as well. I mean, one of the notable ones is if you're wearing a mask, a face mask, and if you have an Apple Watch, you can go into the Face ID section of your settings on your phone and you can say allow my Apple Watch to automatically unlock my iPhone when it detects that I'm wearing a mask so that it avoids the you know, the hassle of having to type in a code, uh, which also in the wintertime, you often have gloves on and uh, that can make it very difficult to tap on the screen of the phone. So that's a handy little feature with Watch OS in Australia and Vietnam. Apple finally switched on the ability to use the ECG or the electrocardiogram. That's been something that's available since Apple Watch Series 4 and we're now with Apple Watch Series 6. So in Australia, we've had three generations finally of Apple approved. Watch. Yeah. It's finally been approved by the TGA. And there was talk that Apple actually didn't submit it to the TGA for some time. I'm not sure why they did or didn't do that. But as more and more countries around the world had it switched on over the past three years, finally, the TGA did approve that, uh, even if it took Apple some time to, to submit it for that approval. So I checked it. You put your finger on the digital digital crown and I have what's known as a sinus pulse, which is the normal sort of pulse. But if I had atrial fibrillation or some other sort of related heart condition that it could pick up, it would tell me. But it does warn you that it can't detect heart attacks. And if you are experiencing problems with your heart and you know, you're not feeling well, then definitely contact your doctor. But there have been people in the States who have received notifications, hey, you've got atrial fibrillation, go and see your doctor straight away. And they have. And you hear stories that some people went into the operating theater pretty much straight away. So it's good to have this sort of functionality. And it's kind of that Star Trek tricorder sort of science fiction it's turning into science there, fact. It? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, ability to be able to, to uh, track yourself and uh, compare that with previous uh, readings and you can, uh, you know, ha handy for you, handy for your doctor. Indeed. Now also, have you got your new AirTags yet? Yes, I received AirTags, a review units from Apple. I got the four pack and uh, they're smaller than the size of a 50 cent coin, about the size of a 20 cent coin in Australia. They take a C2032 uh, battery inside. There's jokes online that uh, this is one of the only products from Apple that has an easily removable battery. <laughs> but uh, this was the easiest way to do it and you didn't have to worry about recharging. The battery life about a year and the air tags are uh, similar in operation to the tile or the chipolo tags that are, have been on the market for some time. They will allow you to track your keys, your luggage, backpacks, uh, other devices that you attach an air tag to uh, using Bluetooth low energy and uh, they're is a ultra wideband chip inside, which is compatible with the U1 chip inside of the iPhone 11 and iPhone 12. And when you use uh, one of those two iPhones to track an AirTag, it actually can show you with precision how far away you are. And it's got an arrow on screen that points in different directions to show you where the item is. And if you're getting hotter or colder, it's a particular item. And it, and it shows you how many meters and how close you are. So it's very handy. But what also sets the air tags apart is that all of the iPhones, iPads, and Macs that can ping those devices securely and anonymously via Bluetooth can act as a repeater. So if you've left your keys across town or your backpack or something across town, something requires an iPhone to sort of walk by it to receive this anonymous ping to then tell you, hey, we detect your air tag connected to whatever device it was connected to in this location. So and, I could uh, be walking down the road and my iPhone could pick up someone else's air tags and automatically ping the owner, your air tags are at this location. And I that's right, yeah. Know I mean, about it. You wouldn't even know, yeah. And Apple doesn't know where the location of things are either. So it's not as if uh, it can be used to track you. And people have said, well, what if somebody slips a, an air tag into your pocket or into your backpack or something without you knowing it? And if an air tag's been following you for about three days, it will alert you on your phone that, hey, we detected this unknown air tag. And if you ignore that, it will, after a while, start also making a noise so that you can find it. I mean, you can imagine if someone slipped an air tag into the lining of your jacket. You're uh, so you devious, know. I would never have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's Alex Sahar of Reut from ity.com. That's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 